We're back. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, if you are new around here, um, we've been covering a series of essays put out by Kaepernick Publishing on police abolition. And uh, this particular one is uh, the first in the category of essays called Abolition Now, which um, a lot of them have been making the case for why we need it. This is the first one of the series of ones that actually explains specifically how it might look in implementation. Because um, that's always a question. Uh, but first, you know, have to establish... I think it made sense the way that it's structured to establish why it's needed first, and then to address the how uh, after. Uh, these are intended as kind of discussion segments, so while I will be reading it and providing my own thoughts, uh, I encourage uh, everyone to also share their own thoughts and interject if you have questions or have comments to make on the subject as we're as we're going through. Um, the author, Dr. Robin Kelly, is a uh, has written many books, actually. Uh, they are a researcher from UCLA uh, in studying uh, the African diaspora, surrealism, Marxism, and other topics. Um, written subjects, or written books like Africa Speaks, Modern Jazz in Revolutionary Times, The Life and Times of an American Original, uh, Freedom Dreams, um, Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, and many others. So he's, um, he's written a lot. He's written a lot. So let's see what he has to say on this. Boop. Change from the Roots by Robin D.G. Kelly What abolition looks like from the Panthers to the people. Calls to defund prisons and policing is neither new nor helplessly utopian. It begins with... Oh, shoot. Sorry. It begins with a quote. What if Trayvon Martin was offered a ride home instead? From the book... Uh, Dream Defenders, Defund Police, and Rebuild Our Communities. Um, by itself, that's... It's a provocative question, and it gets to the heart of what police abolition looks like. Um, you know, as we've been examining, the institution of policing is only able to inflict violence. That's their sole vocation. Um, they have no uh, institutional avenue to actually provide support for or help for communities that they are assigned to serve. Um, any help that is provided is incidental in and is you know questionable and it's it's only as a result of that violence um which means that it's not helping everyone in the community it would only be helping those who are benefiting from that violence 
what we're seeing more and more is that those lines are drawn racially and along class lines who is actually being helped by this instrument of state violence so yeah the slogan defund the police has become a political lightning rod to Donald Trump and his people, it's a terrorist plot hatched by socialists, red Democrats, and thugs, red black people. Joe Biden and most of his party stalwarts run from the idea, proposing instead to increase funding for law enforcement for better equipment and training. That's actually true. Um, since Joe Biden has gotten into office, he has, uh, generally speaking, increased police budgets. Abolition also has its share of critics on the left who think it's a utopian fantasy and a political dead end. All sides share two things in common. They believe police keep us safe, and they fundamentally misunderstand the demand to defund or abolish the police. The first one is simply not true. That's not the role of policing. And the second one, that's what, you know, that's why we've been covering these essays to try and clear up some of those misunderstandings. I've certainly learned a lot through, through discussing these and reading these myself. For black, brown, indigenous, and other communities of color, especially the poor, women, and LGBTQ folks, the police are often a threat to safety and security, alongside a racist and sexist criminal justice system, inadequate income, housing, health care, and schools, and neighborhoods divested of services and overrun with toxins and unchecked violence. This is why abolition is necessary. Abolition works to dismantle systems that have caused harm, namely police and prisons, and reallocate funds to social and economic resources, and to develop new systems of community-controlled public safety and restorative justice. The Movement for Black Lives, a coalition made up of over 150 organizations, came up with a plan to divest billions of dollars from prisons, policing, and the Pentagon and invest in education, universal health care, housing, living wage jobs, restorative justice, food justice, and green energy. Um, right. So, you know, at the heart of that is the, the premise that the way that you actually reduce crime is you remove the conditions that lead someone to act in a criminal be manner. So it's, it's two part. One is there's a lot of unjust laws on the books straight up, like the war on drugs and everything else just exist to make arrests. And the other half of it is in a system that forces people to become destitute and hungry, they're going to do what it takes to survive. Uh, that is just the nature of the human condition. Um, if instead of spending all of that money punishing people who fail in a system that sets them up to fail, if you instead put those same resources and money into helping lift everyone up and installing safety nets and ensuring food security, housing security, etc., they would have no reason to, you know, enter into criminal behavior. For example, since 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security, which, as a reminder, was established as a result of 9-11. Oh, goodness. Flanker. 
I'm a flanker. Oh, goodness. Um, how are you doing? We were just getting started here on continuing the discussion for police abolition. <laughs> I had just finished up with some Rimworld. Come on in. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, yeah, this is intended as kind of a discussion platform, so I'm reading this, I'm offering my thoughts, but I invite people to offer up their own thoughts as well and engage with the discussion if you, if you watched, if you wish to. So yeah, get cozy. Uh, yeah. For example, since 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security gave over $30 billion in direct grants to state and local f law enforcement. And the DOD, uh, DOD's 1033 program issued some $7 billion worth of surplus military equipment to police departments as well as, uh, as well law enforcement units to select colleges and school districts. The federal government doles out billions with little oversight and no accountability and no evidence that we are safer as a result of militarized policing. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Um, there's a very strong correlation between the militarization of policing and people being shot by police. The M4BL um, policy platform proposes reallocating these funds to long-term safety strategies such as educational, community, restorative justice, and employment programs. The data is clear. Children in a Chicago study who did not participate in pre preschool programs were 70% more likely to be arrested by age 18. In another study, youth who participated in summer job programs in Chicago saw a 43% decrease in arrests over a 16-month period. Shifting $37 billion from policing to education and restorative justice initiatives will not only strengthen communities, it will make them safer. Again, support people, give them those opportunities in their lives, in their economics, give them some semblance of security. And the results speak for themselves way more than the assumed deterrence of the ever expanding police state you know we have we have police armed to the teeth more than ever before now and it isn't actually serve it never has served as a deterrent for crime because when you are starving, you will do what you have to to get food in your mouth. Um, ignoring that basic premise is just kind of absurd to me. So yeah, um, it makes sense to invest in communities and in people and set them up so that they don't ever get into those situations. Abolition is neither new nor hopelessly utopian. On the contrary, after over half a century of reforms, police and prisons continue to enact irreparable harm to vulnerable populations. None of the police reforms currently proposed are new. Civilian review boards, better training, altering use of force policy, more tasers, more transparency, more black cops, residency requirements, uh, better data to flag patterns of misconduct, body, body cams, and banning chokeholds. These reforms have not stopped the wanton killing and beating of civilians or made communities that are consistently policed any safer. Before George Floyd's execution in Minneapolis, 
The city's police department was a poster child of reform. Minneapolis's diverse force was well-trained in mental health crisis intervention, implicit bias, de-escalation, and praised for being exceptionally compassionate. Yeah, um, a lot, they might need to go out again. Yeah, several cities have, and, and states have enacted all of the reforms in various places uh, uh, yeah. that are being talked about today as the solution to police violence. But, uh, it kind of, it, <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, welcome Lou and Raiders. We, uh, we're currently digging through, uh, an essay here on, uh, police abolition. So, settle in, get cozy. Um, and yeah, uh, these are, of course, intended as open discussion. So, if you have thoughts and want to chime in, feel free. Uh, admittedly, most of this is focused on American policing, but I'm sure some of it applies elsewhere as well. Um, At the moment, we were observing that uh, all the reforms that are currently being proposed by the Biden administration and Democrats in general um, have been attempted over decades in various places across the country with no with no notable impact on uh, police violence. It just changes sometimes how that violence manifests. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, police are just a instrument of state violence. That's their only function. So, um, yeah. Had I finished that paragraph? Yes. A decade of unremitting police violence, followed by non-indictments, has inspired new movements to embrace abolitionist principles. Those organizations include Black Lives Matter, Dream Defenders, Black Youth Project 100, Wheat Charge Genocide, Bold, Million Hoodies Movement for Justice, Dignity and Power Now, Ella's Daughters, Asada's Daughters, Black Feminist Future, Know Your Rights Camp, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, the Let Us Breathe Collective, to name just a few. Before Black Lives Matter became a hashtag, Oakland's Black Organizing Project and the Community Rights Campaign in Los Angeles were fighting to demilitarize schools, decriminalize tardiness and truancy, and abolish school police. The, the fact that Demilitarize schools is a term is really disheartening. But it is. In Ferguson, Missouri, in the wake of Michael Brown's death, black youth in Hands Up United, Lost Voices, and Millennial Activists United gave us a model of a sustained revolt dedicated to police abolition that inspired a group of anarchists to publish a pamphlet, A World Without Police, and launch a companion website. Abolishing the police is not the brainchild of some extreme left-wing think tank, but a product of grassroots social movements fighting police violence and racially biased laws, while simultaneously trying to make their own communities safer. We've been told that Richard Nixon's stance against rising crime and urban rebellions won him the presidency in 1968 a strategy Trump is currently trying to replicate. Bearing in mind this was written in 2020. But the wave of urban rebellions were responses to police violence, 
exacerbated by the violence of disinvestment, segregation, and poverty. The Black Panther Party was formed in 1966 in Oakland, California, precisely to monitor police violence, to create community-based models of public safety, and to provide for social needs of black communities where the state failed. I like this opening sentence to this paragraph. I like the inclusion of this, actually, in general, because there's a lot of there's been a long running smear campaign against the Black Panther Party to just dress them up as violent, you know, domestic terrorists, which they weren't. They, um, they recognized that the state was not going to protect them or their communities, was not going to take care of them or their communities and make sure that they had food on the table and such. So they propped up several, you know, community run programs and safety networks to try and fill in those holes, those gaps. And in response, we form SWAT. We, I mean, the United States. And uh, the LAPD slaughtered them. Panthers around the country patrolled the streets, held Know Your Rights workshops, exposed the names of brutal cops, and in various places provided free medical care, free clothing, and groceries. Ran free breakfast and lunch programs for children, food banks, community gardens, drug rehab centers, ambulance services, and housing cooperatives. These efforts at mutual aid were deemed so dangerous to national security that FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover dubbed the Panthers as the greatest threat to internal security of the country. Are you kidding me? Oh no. People are providing free breakfast to children. It just it makes me mad reading this stuff. BPP members, along with other liberation movement activists, sought to reimagine criminal justice at the Reven Revolutionary People's Con Constitutional Convention held in Philadelphia in 1970. They proposed reorganizing the police as a rotating, volunteer, non-professional body coordinated by the Police Control Board from a weekly list of volunteers from each community section. Board members would be elected and its policies approved by popular vote, and community rehabilitation programs would replace jails and prisons. However, through systematic raids on Panther headquarters, surveillance, agent provocateurs, targeted assassinations, and harassment, the police and FBI actually created a dangerous and insecure environment. See, that's what they were afraid of. That's why the Panthers were deemed such a threat. Because they dared question this arm of state violence. And the state can't tolerate that, it seems. It's always an uphill battle to wrangle power back from the state to communities, to the people that the state is supposed to serve. And especially in a police state, which it's not an exaggeration to say that the United States is. I mean, we, <laughs> we have one of, we, we have the biggest like carceral carceral population per capita in the world. So yeah, I think it's definitely legitimate to say 
or a police state. Today's vision of abolition, rooted in anti-prison movements, can be traced to the long 1990s, 1989 through 2003, to opposition to Bush and Clinton era, era neoliberalism, the war on drugs, the war on terror, prison expansion, the movement to free political prisoners, police violence, anti-black and anti-immigration or anti-immigrant racism, Islamophobia, and violence against women of color and the LGBTQ community. Yeah. These are all things that we rail on, and they're all very... We're sick of it. Uh... That vision is present in movements like Mother's ROC, Reclaiming Our Children, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, the National Jericho Movement, Prison Activist Resource Center, the Prison Moratorium Project, Critical Resistance, All of Us or None, Labor slash Community Strategy Center, Project South, Southerners on New Ground, Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, Sister to Sister, the Los Angeles Community Action Network, the Praxis Project, Safe Outside the System, Project NIA, Fierce, Queers for Economic Justice, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, Bay Area, Area Transformative Justice Collective, Ubuntu, to name only a few. I am probably going to take this list. Uh, there have been a few lists of movements and stuff in this article. I'm going to make a spreadsheet of them and put links to their uh, pages. Because um, if any of them are operating locally uh, to any of you, that could be a useful resource to find them and connect with, with a local activist group. Um, activism is difficult to do alone. You can only make so much traction uh, by yourself. Uh, people are force multipliers, and the more of us connect with each other and work together, uh, the more influence we're able to have. So... Yeah. The founders and forces behind many of these movements were key theorists of abolition, community organizers, survivors of gender-based violence, formerly incarcerated, and scholar activists whose writings, even if not promoting an abolitionist agenda, profoundly shaped the current generation of activists. The current movement is unimaginable without the writings of my colleagues and compatriots who have also contributed to this project, as well as many others. It is not an accident that gender-based violence, physical, sexual, psychological violence directed towards women, girls, queer, and gender non-conforming people meant to subjugate and maintain gender inequalities emerged as a key abolitionist issue. Women of color, queer, and trans folks are simultaneously criminalized and rem rendered disposable. It is not enough to say the names of those killed by police, but also the tens of thousands whose deaths, disappearances, and abuse go unresolved. You have six times the number of people in jail per population than we... Yeah. Yeah, we do. Our... The United States has a massive carceral population. Um, and the system, like, it's... It's baked into the system to maintain that population. To just make arrests for the sake of making arrests. Especially of... Um, black communities or LGBT communities.
and to make those arrests early so that you can set up people to fail when they are released from their initial conviction um, only to come back in because you know we offer zero support to prisoners um, the prison system is designed to make people return to prison rather than to help get them back on their feet again Um, let's see. Legal scholar and activist Kimberly Crenshaw, who's an author of one of the previous essays that we've covered on here, uh, co-founder of the African American Policy Forum, launched Say Her Name, not only to draw attention to black women killed by police, but to show, uh, but to how the state and the law make them more vulnerable to other forms of violence. Police not only enact harm through direct violence, but by the criminal justice system's inability to address gender-based and intimate violence. Right. Carceral feminists believe that police, prosecution, and prison are the best way to address gender and sexual violence. Abolitionist feminists argue that locking men up in cages reinforces violent behavior and never addresses the problem of sexual violence and its victims. Instead, instead, the carceral state criminalizes and locks up women, transgender, and gender nonconforming communities and perpetuates racial and gender violence against our communities. Um... I suppose it's poignant and uh, appropriate timing to bring up, you know, what's going on with Blizzard and the fact that so many of their employees, their male employees, just felt totally comfortable sexually assaulting and sexually harassing um, female co-workers um, because they had no reason to fear punishment here in America. It's just, it's not a thing. Um, it's very, very difficult to get a conviction. Um, uh, on sexual assault charges. And, uh, you see that in a lot, uh, like you see that in a lot of industries, a lot of companies and in a lot of households because men are simply not held accountable, not even in the wake of the Me Too movement. Did we see meaningful legislation or anything, um, uh, to, to address, you know, sexual violence or violence against um, uh, women or queer or um, gender non-conforming folks. It is still very much a system that protects uh, cis men uh, from any sort of accountability. In 2001, Insight, Women of Color Against Violence and Critical Resistance, issued a statement calling for strategies and analyses that address both state and interpersonal violence, particularly violence against women, and the development of safe community-based responses to violence independent of the criminal justice system and accountable to survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Following the police killing of two teenaged women, uh, women of color in 2000, 
the Brooklyn-based collective Sista to Sista created Sista's Liberated Ground as an alternative to calling the police to deal with gendered violence. At the time, the NYPD had a backlog of over 100,000 domestic violence cases. To protect Sista's Liberated Ground, women were trained in self-defense and conflict resolution. Through street performances, video screenings, discussions, and direct interventions, they dealt with violence as a community issue. As a result, they succeeded in making their community safer without police. In 2008, Insight published a 117-page toolkit offering an array of strategies and resources designed to reduce violence and build caring communities without police. Yeah, um, that's a that's a really great example of um, just setting up a a completely separate back channel to actually address a problem in a community rather than relying on police because police won't help. <laughs> Um, we definitely need more of that, and we need a lot less police. The abolition of police and prisons is not only possible, it is necessary if we are serious about preserving black life. Uh, what the? What? Why? Why did this happen? Hold on. I think my mouse is freaking out. Sorry. Lost my place. Here we go. The abolition of police and prisons is not only possible, it is necessary if we are serious about preserving black life, reducing trauma, creating safer communities, and investing municipal funds in social needs rather than settling wrongful death and excessive force cases. But it will not happen without a political struggle. Because, truth be told, the role of police in the U.S. was never to keep our communities safe, but to protect property and its owners. To function as an occupying force in America's impoverished ghettos, barrios, and reservations. To use coercive force to oversee criminalized populations. And as protesters know firsthand, Police are the first line of defense against strikes, demonstrations, and dissident social movements. Can attest to that firsthand. Abolitionists know it's not enough just to win the argument, and that abolition is not an event but a process, a struggle. Abolitionists expose the system's oppressive character while also fighting to ultimately end state and interpersonal violence and policing, create structures of accountability, demilitarize law enforcement, and solitary confinement, the death penalty, cash bail, resist police and prison expansion, roll back punitive measures, and find ways to interrupt violence and create safety so the police would not have to be called. And there are three links for for the reading um i will endeavor to provide um this he, he dropped a whole bunch of links in here um and they're they're good links uh, a lot of them to organizations and more reading on on the subject so all of these articles have a lot of links in them but this guy was clearly using his essay to amplify uh, a lot of these groups, so I will um, respect that and um, get those copied over into the Discord if you want to catch that. So yeah, this was uh, Dr. Robin Kelly's Change from the Roots. Um, I believe this was essay 22. 30 
in the Abolition for the People series. We are coming up on the last few. So I always find these very insightful, very thoughtful. This one was no different. Um, this series uh, should be... The next several essays should be very interesting because they are focused more on what implementation looks like. And in this one, uh, Dr. Kelly provided several examples of actual implementation. Um, not of actual full-on police abolition, because the state will currently not allow that, but of communities that built their own safety networks. And by circumventing police and doing what they could to reduce reliance on the police made their communities safer and improved their the health of their own communities. If the police's job was actually to serve communities and help them be better, safer places, that would not be the case. But that's not what police do. So yeah, um, that was that. Let's go ahead and shift over to unstructured discussion. 